So we heard from ILAR. We're going to hear now from um, several representatives of other organizations that have addressed the reproducibility issue. And so our next speaker is Julie Griffin from the Canadian Council of Animal for Animal Care. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you. Let's move the snicker bars out of my temptation. Um, so really, uh, what I'm going to talk to you today, although I'm here um, from the um, Canadian Council on Animal Care, I'm going to talk to you about an initiative that's been put in place by the International Council for Laboratory Animal Science. Um, So I've been asked to say a few words about ECLAS's initiative to harmonize reporting guidelines for the animal-based studies. In doing so, I'm going to talk about some of the initiatives that led up to the desire on ECLAS's part, part to uh, provide a harm or try and provide a harmonized approach to reporting. I'm going to mention briefly um, the, the concern about the quality of animal studies. Obviously, that's been talked about a lot already this morning, so uh, with the benefit of talking this afternoon, I'll go through that quite quickly. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the events that led up to the Declaration on Synthesis of Evidence at the World Congress um, on Animal Use, on Alternatives in Animal Use in the Life Sciences in 2011, because that was also a spark to ECLAS's initiative. Mentioning briefly the proliferation of reporting guidelines that's already been talked about a bit, but the lack of implementation, and then talk about the class harmonization exercise um, in trying to define key principles for reporting of animal studies. And then I'll briefly, too, mention implementation. So I think there were kind of three uh, key issues that came together around the time of the Eighth World Congress on Alternatives and Animal Use in the Life Sciences, which was hosted by my, host organize, my home organization, the Canadian Council on Animal Care. Firstly, there was this sort of mounting uh, recognition that animal studies are being poorly designed and reported, and I you know, allude to the Kilkenny paper, which others have done, but for many years, people like Michael Festing and Doug Altman had also been um, pointing to poor experimental design and statistical reporting. There was also the mounting concern that animal studies are not translating into clinical treatments. And so again, I'm pointing to Malcolm McLeod's uh, work in stroke, but also this had been pointed out in the areas of cancer research, multiple sclerosis, pain, et cetera, et cetera. And thirdly, and I guess um, for my own role in this, um, and for the Eighth World Congress on Alternatives and Animal, and animal Use in the Life Sciences, the concern that if, um, if, animal, if data from animal research is not being translated into the clinic, if it's not uh, proving to be useful, then in effect, animals' lives are being wasted. So we had discussions at the Eighth World Congress in, in uh, developing this declaration on the synthesis of evidence to advance the three R's principles um, in science. And it did result in a declaration that was supported by the delegates. However, I have to say it was not the easiest of processes. I think because of the general concern that studies were of, of poor quality, and so synthesis of evidence in the end is a bit of a challenge. So the Montreal Declaration um, called for a change in the culture of planning, executing, reporting, reviewing, and translating um, of animal-based research. But the challenge in finding agreement mainly um, led in the fact that the participants were concerned that there was nothing that was going to change unless journals implemented reporting guidelines. And in fact, some of the discussion uh, centered around the fact that really maybe the declaration should have been more about trying to implement reporting guidelines rather than trying to implement the, a sort of wider um, synthesis of evidence approach. So as others have done, I mean, there are, as you know, a plethora of guidelines. There was the ARRIVE guidelines published from the NC3Rs as a follow-up to the Kilkenny paper. Um, and now we know that you know, well over 300 journals have endorsed the ARRIVE guidelines. 
There's the gold standard publication list, perhaps published by Radboud University as a response to not being able to uh, carry out good systematic reviews. There was the ILAR description of animal research in scientific publications in 2011 too. There's the MIBI project, which aims to pull together minimal, um, minimal information guidelines um, in one place. And then there have been, you know, a, a, again, a, a large number of disease society guidelines that have tried to sort of either adopt the ADRIVE guidelines and tailor them to their specific needs. Um, as well as following on from the U.S. National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Strokes stakeholder meeting, the Landis um, publication checklist. I'm just borrowing a couple of slides from uh, one of my colleagues in the E-Class working group to look at um, reporting of um, editorial, editorial policies concerning animals. And she looked between 2005 and 2009 um, and looked at publication policies of a total of 868 different journals. She did it on a, a sort of yearly basis and looking to see how whether journals had publication policies, whether they mentioned animals, and whether they mentioned things like humane endpoints, appropriate anesthesia, analgesia, method of euthanasia, staff were trained, etc. And so what she found was that uh, for a full, uh, I think, 40% of journals, there was sort of no, there was editorial policies, but no mention of animals at all in the editorial policies, despite the fact that, that they were journals publishing animal-based research. Um, they, this data obviously was, it was pulled from journals before the publication of the ARRIVE guidelines. But I think you can see that, you know, for, she gave a score to each of one, to each of the potential um, issues such as humane endpoints, anesthesia and so forth that you might get a score for. Journals scored one if they actually mentioned an animal. Um, so you can see that there's sort of a, a, a wide range from zero to nine. No journal scored more than nine. The range went up to 12. Um, so there were four journals that ma managed to publish um, um, nine different aspects of the, the ethics of animal use. So moving on to look at um, the endorsement of the ARRIVE guidelines, it's already, this paper by Baker et al. has already been mentioned, um, it was published this year, and it looked at the impact of the endorsement of the ARRIVE guidelines. So they looked at papers from PLOS Biology and from Nature, both of which had published the ARRIVE guidelines. And I hope you can see from this slide that um, there is a not a lot of difference between po pre and post arrive guidelines, which is the sort of the thesis of the, the paper. There was some improvement in reporting of allocation to group. Uh, there was unfortunately a decrease in uh, reporting of blinding and both before and after the ARRIVE guidelines, there was no reporting of uh, sample size. So we talked about this at the governing board meeting of the International Council for Laboratory Animal Science, essentially following on from the World Congress. So ECLAS, for those of you who don't know, is an international scientific organization um, it was established in 1956 under the auspices of UNESCO. And while much of the work of E-Class is aimed at the sort of the quality of laboratory animals and the standards um, of their use worldwide, in particular to bring developing countries up to speed, I guess, with, with generally accepted international standards, the organization does also see a role for itself in ensuring quality-based animal, <coughs> animal science. So in doing so, um, one of the committees, which I currently chair, is focused on harmonization of international guidelines to establish generally accepted principles. And so far, the organization has worked on principles for euthanasia, for humane endpoints, for the ethical review of projects, for training, for genetically altered animals, and most recently with the Council of International Organizations of Medical Sciences to revise their basic principles of biomedical sciences. So 
Just to give you a little bit of an understanding of the E-Class harmonization process, typically um, the organization through the harmonization committee will establish a working group. They'll look at key international reference documents. They'll conduct an analytical comparison of those documents. They'll try and synthesize key principles um, and then circulate for review and revise, usually ad nauseum. Um, and then publish with uh, key reference documents, usually on the E-Class website, but we also try and get publication within uh, a scientific journal. Um, the Euthanasia and Endpoints was published in Science, and the Genetically Altered Animals has just been published in Laboratory Animals. So in terms of harmonization of the reporting guidelines, the work so far has been to form a working group. We managed to do that in 2012. And what we did was we asked all the key organizations that had developed uh, reporting guidelines to participate in the process. So we have Meryl Ritzkis Heutinger from Radboud University, Lida from ILAR, Nikki Osborne, because she was involved in trying to evaluate uh, publication policies of journals, as well as Mark Avey, who is my uh, research fellow at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, and fortunately is working with people like David Moore and Jeremy Grimshaw, who are experts in, in guideline development in the, in, in the human clinical trials area. For the most part, we've met electronically and by teleconference, but we did have, manage to have two face-to-face -face meetings of some of the members at least, uh, one at the Second International Symposium on Systematic Reviews of Laboratory Animal Science, which was held in Edinburgh at um, Markham's shop in, in March 2013, and then um, at the Third World Conference on Research Integrity in Montreal in May. So as far as the work so far, uh, we've taken this sort of E-class principles approach, and we've also been trying to follow on from reporting guidelines development process uh, that was established or, or reported by uh, David Moore et al. in 2011. Basically, what we've been trying to do is to have an explicit methodology to undergo a sort of transparent <coughs> development process, and then uh, with a, in the future, because we haven't got there yet, to kind of talk about um, implementation and evaluation. So far, we've compared available guidelines. We carried out um, a compilation of guidelines where, strong, where there was strong or medium agreement. Uh, we prepared a list of key principles, and then we circulated that to journal editors at the end of last year, um, asking for their feedback sort of late January, uh, which of course extended into February, March, um, and then compiled the, the feedback received. And we're currently in the process of, of revising the document. So in general, we were really pleased that with the, we were pleased with the extent of the feedback we, we received, from, particularly from the bigger journals such as Nature, the PLOS family, Wiley, the uh, COPE, is it that committee of publication editors, the physiological societies, etc. Um, I think in general, journal editors were very supportive of the approach. Um, and actually, we've had or I, I've had follow-up emails asking me when the document's going to be published. Um, there was some concern by journal editors who felt that this was yet another set of guidelines that they would have to implement and police. Um, some uh, journal editors asked for um, really simplified principles, which had kind of been our intent, given that the ARRIVE guidelines and others had, been, had proved difficult to implement. However, the same journal editors then were also requesting the addition of, addition of, of, of more details. Um, but I think, ironically, while the principles were being circulated, there was a PLOS Biology editorial and a blog by uh, Nature's editor-in-chief calling for a core set of reporting standards that are flexible enough to work for a broad range of studies. So that was kind of encouraging to us. What I'm going to do just for the next little while is just flip through the principles um, very quickly. The principles themselves have come with a sort of a, a principle and then a, a little bit of explanation, but I'm not going to go in depth with the explanation. The principles in black are those ones that we had uh, developed and circulated, and the principles in whatever color that happens to turn out on the screen, it's, it looks purple to me, are additional principles that were asked by journal editors. So the first um, 
principle is is the requirement for an ethical statement. And I have to say, I mean, already we know that journals are managing to to implement that. For um, in order to harmonise or perhaps to provide examples for for um, countries with with little oversight, we've pointed to the requirements for the E class guidelines on ethics for authors and reviewers as perhaps a starting point. The second principle concerns providing details of the scientific objectives, so the, the rationale for the scientific approach related essentially to the external validity of the study. So I have a, a holding place for a third principle uh, relating to the funding of the study. And this has been shown um, to be important in clinical trials um, as being correlated with the outcome of the study. So far, I don't think we have evidence for that uh, in preclinical studies, which is a sort of hypothesis that was tested by Lisa Barrow's group um, and published earlier this year and showed actually that was that was there wasn't a correlation or there was a correlation um, the other way than than uh, anticipated. In fact, that sort of non-industry um, funding um, was actually showing a more positive response than than industry funding. So the fourth principle concerned the details of the study design. So that's the things that we've been talking about, randomization, um, blinding, etc. The fifth principle concerned details of animal subjects themselves. And so uh, interestingly, some folk indicated that since these protocols, had, uh, these projects had already been undergone ethical review, there was actually no need to include things like species strain, et cetera, in the publications. I think I beg to differ because I think one of my hopes from <coughs> the sort of ability to, to do a, a synthesis of evidence is really to get a, a good understanding of experimental models, whether those models are actually the best um, model to answer the research question. And I, so I, I fail to see how you can do that if you don't have the details of animal subjects. Um, the sixth principle called for the details of experimental protocols. Interestingly, some journal editors asked for um, an increased justification of uh, any projects for withholding pain mitigation. And I just interpret that because uh, to, to mean um, the fact that there's been publication in the literature about, um, from, particularly from Paul Flecknell's group in Newcastle, about not reporting whether anal analgesia or anesthesia is used. And so he's been tracking that over a number of years. And I was sort of interested that this seems to have sort of flowed through the thinking from, from journal editors. Seventh principle asks for details of housing and husbandry. And we certainly know from the work of Hannah Verbal and others that these details can have a significant effect on, on research data. So these, this slide contains additional principles which were requested by journal editors. So the eighth one was, was details of permits and consent for client-owned animals, etc. I think that that could probably be wrapped in with the first principle, although I'm currently sort of enamored with the fact that if we adopt all these, we'll have a nice, neat 10 principles. Um, the call for um, data sharing of, is, of course, getting louder. And uh, with Nature launching its scientific data journal last week, but that was certainly an additional principle that was asked for by journal editors. And then some editors felt that it would be a good practical step to ask for a completed checklist at the time of submission. And I think we've heard somebody, um, more than one person probably talk about that today in terms of, you know, if you had a checklist that you could then give to uh, reviewers, um, that they would have then an easy way of going through the paper and, and it would make their lives um, a lot easier. And I know uh, as a section editor myself, I get reviews uh, from reviewers and clearly they have not gone through any of this this process and I understand everybody's busy. So we know that currently that these guidelines that are out there are not being implemented and so um, taking on board the feedback from journals um, we, it's been recommended to us that E-Class prepare a complete package would assist journals in implementation. And these would include a core set of principles, minimal um, acceptable guidelines with a checklist, such as those of, of Landis, uh, 
and then recommended best practice modules for which journals could include, for instance, the additional information in the ARRIVE guidelines, the additional information in the gold standard publication list, etc. So in terms of next steps, we're currently um, wrapping up the revision of the document. We'll be meeting with the class governing board in July. We hope to have further consultation with journals and, and following that publication. And then we'll look at implementation and evaluation. Um, and I want to finish, uh, that, that's essentially my last slide. But in conclusion, I think we've got sufficient evidence that animal studies are not being properly reported and that the situation hasn't improved. So one of the things that we found in other areas is that by working on international harmonization, it then encourages everybody else to, to do more and step up to the plate. And that's what we're hoping with the initiative. All hands on deck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jonathan Kemmelman. Jonathan, who is uh, also comes from Canada, from McGill University. Hi. So the second Canadian, the second non-Canadian Canadian, <laughs> anyone here who's not from the United States can probably hear my American accent. Okay. So um, the main goal of any experiment is to establish a cause and effect relationship. So when you do preclinical research, the goal is to establish a cause and effect relationship between a drug and a disease response. Not just any cause and effect relationship, but one within the animal that will generalize to patients that you're trying to model. Now there's a lot that morally rides on establishing an accurate assessment of the magnitude and sign of that cause and effect relationship. I probably don't need to remind this audience of what morally rides on that determination, but I will nevertheless. First, of course, is the fact that animal experiments involve sentient beings. These animals experience suffering much as human beings experience suffering. Therefore, at the very least, we want to ensure that their sacrifice is redeemed by some kind of social good in the form of generalizable and reliable knowledge. A second reason is because preclinical research ultimately establishes the warrant for exposing patients to unproven and potentially unsafe drugs. Moreover, the vast majority of drugs, as we know, that are introduced into clinical development, fail clinical translation, highly expensive process, that cost is ultimately absorbed into the cost of pharmaceuticals. If we want to maintain solvent healthcare systems, we want to also be able to uh, address validity threats in preclinical research. Now, there's a third under-recognized reason why it's crucial that we have accurate assessments of cause and effect relationships in animal studies. We often think of animal studies as informing clinical medicine only indirectly with the intermediary of the clinical trial. But in fact, there are many ways in which animal research directly informs healthcare practice. The reality is that patients don't come in the neat, tidy boxes that you encounter in clinical trials and for, you know, with all the eligibility criteria. Inevitably, physicians encounter patients with all sorts of idiosyncratic conditions, and they need to interpolate and extrapolate that clinical trial evidence to make bedside decisions. That interpolation and extrapolation is made on the basis of pathophysiological and pharmacological knowledge, and that information itself is gleaned from animal studies. Now, I'm a biomedical ethicist, so I'm allowed to think abstractly, but I'll give you a practical example. Uh, the drug cetuximab, a drug that is licensed for treatment of colorectal cancer, for patients that have a wild-type version of the KRAS gene. Now, there are some patients that have mutations of this gene that are relatively rare mutations. So if you're a clinician and you're uh, encountering a patient with, with colorectal cancer and you're trying to decide whether or not to give cetuximab, you don't necessarily have good trial evidence to determine whether or not a patient with these rare mutations is going to respond. That evidence ultimately has in the past and will continue in the future to rely heavily on preclinical studies of that mutation, of, of xenografts uh, containing that mutation. So the title of this session is All Hands on Deck. What are we doing to uh, address some of these validity threats that we've talked about? To get to that, we first need to identify what the problems are. And so my talk's going to divide into three sections. First, I'm going to de describe the core problems. Next, I'm going to describe some of the activities 
uh, that are being undertaken to address these problems. And I want to close by describing some unrealized opportunities for addressing validity threats in preclinical research. OK, so first, let's try to think about the process of research, any research, but preclinical research, as being cyclical and dividing into four different segments. So we have the planning, design, reporting, uptake of the findings that's absorbed ultimately into the planning of a subsequent cycle of experiments. There are validity threats in preclinical research that loom at each of these different uh, segments of the cycle. Let's start with planning. Now, in clinical research, we've devised methods for systematically planning clinical research. It's a requirement in some jurisdictions, in Canada being one of them, that you perform systematic review prior to initiating clinical trials in patients. But we all know that systematic review is relatively uncommon in the realm of preclinical research. By my quick and dirty count on PubMed, the ratio of systematic reviews of preclinical versus of clinical studies is somewhere on the order of 20 to, you know, 20 to 1, 30 to 1, somewhere around there. So uh, not very effective planning in the way we do preclinical research and in the way we do clinical research that's grounded in preclinical research. Moving on to the design, Clinical medicine has adopted a whole series of different practices aimed at addressing validity threats, at minimizing the effects of bias and random variation. We know, we've heard already this morning, that preclinical research has only sporadically implemented these various practices. I don't need to go through this figure. Everyone knows by heart all the numbers in the Kilkenny paper. Uh, very rare, d rarely does one encounter studies that use, for example, a priori power calculations. Randomization is relatively uncommon as well. Moving on to reporting, in clinical research, we have two different mechanisms by which we ensure accurate and complete reporting. Uh, not as effective as we would want them to be, but they nevertheless are uh, fairly, uh, they've been fairly productive at writing the evidence ship within clinical medicine. One of them is clinical trial registration, and the other is reporting guidelines. Now, one of the big problems in preclinical research is the accessibility of the evidence. So my team just recently published an article in British Journal of Pharmacology looking at the volume of preclinical evidence available for a cohort of 47 new drugs that were introduced into clinical development between 2000 and 2003. And what we found was that for three of the 47 drugs in our cohort, there never has been, never was any publication of any preclinical evidence on those drugs. For about a third of those drugs, um, there were no preclinical studies that were matched for the indication that was tested in the clinical studies. And for about a fifth of the, study, of, the, of the drugs, no preclinical studies had been published prior to the publication of the first trials. So a big issue in preclinical research is accessibility of the evidence, particularly in commercially funded uh, research. Another big issue is incomplete reporting. Obviously, you can't interpret a preclinical study if you don't know how the study was done. We've heard a little bit about this. We've undertaken a systematic review of a cancer drug, sunitinib, uh, preclinical studies, and we've had to throw away 25% of the animal studies because a sample size wasn't given in the methods or because there's no measure of dispersion. So three quarters of the you know, evidence content is just thrown away. Moving on to uptake, there are various, uh, a whole suite of different measures used in clinical medicine to promote uptake of findings. I'm only going to talk about one of them in particular, which is the standardization of different research practices. So if you're a cancer researcher, there are standard techniques that you use for measuring tumor response, the resist criteria, and there are standard methods for grading adverse events. And that enables researchers to compare side by side a series of different studies. It allows you to aggregate those findings in systematic review. In preclinical research, uh, to say that there isn't standardization is an understatement. This is a sort of heat map from the systematic review that we're undertaking of the drug sunitinib that shows the variation in methods that are used to test the tumor response for sunitinib in renal cell carcinoma xenografts. And so each color represents a different technique used. Uh, each column is a different aspect of the experimental design. So in column one, that's the species. All of them use mice. Great. Uh, column two is the sex. So most of them use female. Too bad for them. Uh, then there's a small number that use male. And as you see, as you go further and further to the right, you get more and more heterogeneity. Even in something as narrow as renal cell carcinoma for a given drug, sunitinib, you find only two replications in this entire data set. Uh, 
obviously it becomes very difficult to compare findings and to synthesize findings in a meaningful way if there's so much heterogeneity of the techniques that are being used. And that, of course, frustrates the process of systematic review and the planning for subsequent research. So what kinds of activities are underway to address these issues? Let's start with the planning. Of course, everyone here knows that there are various teams like Circle, Camarades, that are pioneering uh, both the techniques and also you know, pursuing and also training in uh, systematic review of preclinical studies. In addition, I'll mention that there is a new journal on Wiley, uh, evidence-based preclinical medicine, that provides a forum for the uh, deposition of these systematic review results. With respect to design, my group undertook a systematic review of preclinical study guidelines. These are guidelines aimed at laying out what should be done if you want to put a drug into clinical development. This was published in PLOS Medicine 2013. And what we did there is perform a multi-pronged search of the literature uh, and of uh, individuals uh, that we queried to capture all the guidelines out there that specify how you ought to design preclinical studies in order to inform clinical trials. After applying a series of eligibility criteria, we distilled those down into 26 guidelines. And the guidelines cross a variety of different disease areas. Almost half of them uh, are guidelines concerning development of drugs in the neurological and cerebrovascular realm. But we found guidelines in areas like uh, neuromuscular disease, arthritis, sepsis as well. And we then sorted the prescriptions containing these guidelines according to the type of validity threat that they primarily addressed. And we found 18 different prescriptions in these various guidelines addressing threats to internal validity. These prescriptions are things like uh, using concealed allocation, blinded outcome assessment, uh, et cetera. We found 25 prescriptions addressing construct validity threats. Construct validity refers to the match between the experimental system and what you are trying to model, the clinical scenario that you're trying to model. So things like matching co-interventions in the preclinical study that you anticipate will be used in the clinical setting uh, was a relatively common recommendation. And we found six different recommendations uh, for addressing threats to external validity. External validity refers to the ability of a cause and effect relationship to withstand variations in setting, treatment, uh, experimental units, uh, et cetera. The robustness, uh, if you will, of uh, an experimental uh, cause and effect relationship. Now, that doesn't exhaust all the initiatives that are out there. Obviously, there are many more. I'm just going to mention one other, which is that some journals have uh, sort of pioneered some innovative strategies to promoting replication. Cortex, in particular, uh, has two different uh, programs. One of them is that they commission replication studies, my understanding is. Uh, in addition, uh, Cortex accepts articles results blind. So they'll accept an article on the basis of a protocol and submit to publishing the result uh, after the protocol is, uh, is implemented and completed and the results are in. Moving on to reporting, here I think we've probably made the most amount of progress within the realm of preclinical research. We've already heard a lot about this. I don't need to get anything any more into uh, the ARRIVE guidelines. Uh, we know that these have been widely uh, endorsed. Another familiar slide from a previous speaker Despite the fact that they've been endorsed, they haven't necessarily been taken up into practice, but let's give this some time. I think that uh, it may have taken a long time for reporting guidelines and clinical research to be taken up, so uh, I'm actually uh, hopeful that um, this may represent uh, uh, a bias in terms of, uh, the, the, or maybe that we haven't given enough time for these uh, practices to entirely set in. What I think it's important to remember about reporting guidelines is that they feed back on design by signaling to researchers what they need to do in order to get their papers accepted. And so it's important to sort of think about there being feedback loops uh, throughout this cycle, and reporting is really critical uh, in, in, in that function. Numerous commentators, including my group, have argued that we ought to establish preclinical study registries. Not a very popular argument to make, uh, particularly within the private sector. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's an argu argument that's been made. I'm not aware that this has been widely implemented, but I have found at least one case of a preclinical study registry uh, out there, Cure uh, uh, the uh, Congenital Muscular Dystrophy Association. And uh, moving on to uptake, um, about two-thirds of the guidelines in our systematic review contained programmatic recommendations that really were aimed at trying to maximize the interoperability of findings across laboratories. Again, remember that heat map that I showed you and the impossibility of trying to repair to, re to compare findings across these different studies. Uh, 
And so some of the kinds of programmatic recommendations one finds in the guidelines include standardized design, standardizing species, uh, you know, conducting research within a multi-center consortium, uh, et cetera. And there have been various teams, I'll mention two in particular, that have tried to take this to heart and implement them. So CSER, which is a consortium of cardioprotection uh, uh, preclinical researchers funded by the NHLBI here in the US, uh, has a standard set of protocols for testing cardioprotection drugs, and there's another uh, similar initiative with the, uh, that's an NIAID funded initiative, the Immune Tolerance Network. Again, standard set of protocols meant to improve the interoperability of findings across different laboratories and across different platforms, uh, treatment platforms. Now, there are a number of different actors who have uh, a lot at stake in trying to improve the reprodu uh, uh, reproducibility of findings. There are a number of actors who are engaged in trying to address these issues. There are two categories of actors that I think have been really at the vanguard uh, of addressing these issues. Journals, uh, we've already mentioned that, and to some degree funders as well, uh, particularly at NINDS, has funded a number of uh, replication studies and uh, other kinds of initiatives that um, have really set a model for other funding agencies. But there are a number of actors that are really underrepresented here in terms of their activities in addressing these problems. And that brings me to the last part of my talk, the opportunities that are as yet unrealized for addressing some of these validity <coughs> issues and replication issues in preclinical research. First, let's consider the stakeholders who, are not, who have not been particularly visible or active in this realm. So one of them are the regulators. The Food and Drug Administration provides an incredibly powerful incentive for clinical researchers to design studies that are internally valid and that will withstand variation across the clinical trial setting into actual practice settings. Unfortunately, the FDA is not particularly concerned with the uh, rigor and validity of preclinical studies that they review. It's quite clear within their guidance document that this is not a priority when reviewing INDs for initiation of phase one. It's not that they're indifferent to it, it's just simply not a priority. And if regulators are not acting as gatekeepers to encourage uh, uh, more stringent uh, uh, preclinical evaluation, these are of efficacy studies or proof of principle studies, then there's a limited incentive for researchers to undertake these kinds of reforms that we've discussed. As well, IRBs and IACOCs are charged with maintaining a favorable risk-benefit balance. As I mentioned earlier, that risk-benefit balance hinges on the quality of evidence supporting the initiation of a study. They could, in principle, exercise their gatekeeping authorities to encourage researchers to implement some of the kinds of reporting, design, uh, uptake practices that I've described. To my knowledge, IRBs and research ethics in general has been virtually missing in action, sorry to say, on this. I'm not as much of an expert on what animal care committees are doing, but my impression is that animal care committees have not really been at the vanguard or have not been really actively uh, using their authority to address some of these issues. Uh, funding agencies have a bit, a bit of a mixed record. There are some funding agencies that have been really active here, some that have been less active. And one unrealized opportunity that to me uh, is striking is the National, Cancer, or National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, which is an initiative at the NIH um, that is aimed at accelerating uh, uh, clinical translation and that works with the various disease institutes at the NIH. To my knowledge, NCATS has not yet really played a major role in disseminating best practices to various NIH institutes, uh, nor in disseminating reporting practices. So this could, or for that matter, in developing training programs for uh, researchers uh, pursuing uh, preclinical research. What about research domains? I mentioned that almost half the different preclinical research guidelines were in the realm of neurological disease, something that probably is attributable to the impact of the STAIR guidelines. There are a number of disease areas that our systematic review was unable to identify any kind of guidance on design of preclinical studies for addressing validity threats, at least. So cancer is one of the striking striking voids uh, in our systematic review. But also, we weren't able to find any uh, preclinical guidelines in the realm of psychiatric research, respiratory disease, metabolic disease, a whole list of other, other areas. Nor were we able to find any guidelines that addressed particular platforms for innovation or for or therapies. You could imagine cell therapy, preclinical design guidelines, gene transfer, immunotherapy, et cetera. Moving on to the third set of uh, unrealized opportunities. I'll just broadly classify these as programmatic. I see a number of different broad programmatic opportunities for addressing some of the issues of replication. First of all, uh, actually the previous talk alluded to this, 
All the guidelines in our systematic review were developed, large, were developed through informal processes. <coughs> clinical medicine actually has protocols and formal processes for developing clinical practice guidelines. And I think the realm of preclinical research would be greatly served by applying some of these protocols for the development of both reporting guidelines as well as practice guidelines, uh, or design guidelines. Second, I would argue that preclinical testing ought to be structured much in the way we structure clinical research. Right now with clinical research, we have roughly two different stages of clinical development, early phase studies that employ flexible designs, small sample sizes, surrogate endpoints to measure response, and then we have late phase studies or confirmatory studies that test in adequately po powered samples uh, the clinical utility using clinical endpoints and using a pre-specified design. I would suggest that preclinical uh, pre research would greatly benefit by assimilating this kind of structured process. We, together with uh, uh, my co-authors, we recently published an article in PLOS Biology that lays out an argument for this kind of structuring. And in it, we argue that journals ought to require that preclinical studies specify in their method section whether or not they are exploratory or confirmatory studies. And we also argue that IRBs and other authorities ought to require conduct of confirmatory studies, two confirmatory studies preferably, prior to the initiation of clinical development. Hmm, that should be a C, not an A. <laughs> uh, well, this could be classic music, you know, the, the whole ABA form. Okay, so um, the last is incentives. It's one thing to push these kinds of guidelines and practices on researchers, but it's another thing to establish institutional structures uh, that pull researchers to act in this way. And again, I, reported to, I alluded to reporting guidelines as one way of incentivizing actual changes of design. There are a number of actors like funders and journals that have played a key role in incentivizing better design and reporting. There are other actors that have not exercised the authority yet to incentivize uh, better practice across that cycle. And I see two aspects of the cycle, two parts of the cycle, planning and uptake, where there really aren't, to my knowledge, very effective institutional mechanisms that are driving improvement in either of those two spheres. And so I hope that you know, a session like this provides the starting point for trying to not only strengthen what's going on in the design and reporting stages, but also to begin to think about what we ought to be doing to improve the planning and an uptake of preclinical research. Thanks. All right. Um, I see people are lining up. So um, you want to go ahead? Sure. <clears throat> The, the passion of my questions has been inversely related to my knowledge about the subject, and I'm sure you're aware of that. But I do want to uh, point out that in your talk, Dr. Kimmelman, you didn't really say that the institutions should be doing something about this. I'm talking about research institutions. You had them listed there. You didn't put a red or a blue or any other color on them. They are conspicuously absent. Um, and that is a shame. Similarly for the PIs. We have PIs, some of them here, but we don't have very many out there in the world who are saying anything about, anything about this. And part of that is a culture. It's a culture that says, those guys can do what they want. We've got journals, and then we just do the experiments afterwards, and we find out whether it's true. Well, that's you know kind of okay, but not necessarily true. Uh, there's also the fact, let's think about a circumstance in which this approach has worked, and that is in clinical medicine, where in, there's been incentives built in to checklists for lots of things. A group more recalcitrant to advice than surgeons, emergency medicine people, or intensive care unit directors would be difficult to find. Uh, uh, scientists have nothing on those guys. <laughs> and yet they have adopted checklists. 
Okay? Now, why did they adopt them? Part of it was that human lives directly depended on them, and they got convinced that that was the case. Now, it, with the things we're talking about here, it's a little bit of a looser argument. Part of it is that they already had in place some uh, a culture of criticism, of self-criticism. Surgery departments have, and most medical departments have for years had death and complications conferences, which can sometimes be extraordinarily tough. We don't have that in research. We say that review of papers is what's there. We need to put that in. So I think you need to be thinking about how the institutions can change themselves in order to do worthwhile things. So I'll just respond to that really quickly. Um, so the reason I didn't talk about institutions is because I only had 15 minutes to, to talk. Um, so if I had had another five minutes, there would have been another red dot. I actually took one of the other red dots out of the, uh, out of, in, in the interest of time. So I absolutely agree with everything you said. Look, I think institutions, I think all institutions, I mean that in the cosmopolitan sense, change when their brand is on the line. I think the reason why journals like Nature and New England Journal of Medicine have been at the forefront of assimilating reporting guidelines and things like clinical trial registration is not because they're more enlightened. It's because their brand depends heavily on the reproducibility of the findings that they publish. So as long as the, as, as long as the brand of institutions is not at stake, institutions will probably not get in on altering uh, these practices. But um, you know, I absolutely agree that, uh, that institutions are a key part of the puzzle. And I think I perhaps add to that that, uh, you know, at an institution level, certainly in Canada, uh, the way of dealing with uh, animal-based research is through the Animal Care Committee. So I think animal care committees need uh, to be encouraged and, and probably to have additional tools enable in order to be able that to, for them to look at some of the, the issues that affect the quality of animal-based research. Okay. Just a reminder to introduce your – well – yeah, I know Mark McLeod, Mark McLeod from uh, far away. Uh, so thank you for two uh, lovely talks. I, I think there's an issue of how the guidelines are implemented and whether they're implementable is critical. Now, you showed us that there was 26 guidelines that you'd identified. And so my question for you is, in any of those, how many presented empirical evidence that the thing that they asserted was important actually biased the results of the experiment rather than being interesting or making my life as a systematic reviewer easier. And for both of you, do you think the challenge just now is to get another better set of guidelines or is it to work out what those core things are that really do introduce bias and get the journals and others to implement those in improving the standards of what they say? And just as a final thing, uh, as a sort of admission, I'm, I'm chair of the 3R subcommittee of the UK Animals and Science and Committee. And although we haven't done anything yet, uh, we will shortly be moving into this space, I hope. But, uh, but So in our PLOS Medicine article, um, which you reviewed, um, we actually did quantify the fraction of guidelines that cited any evidence at all to support the recommendations, and I can't remember what fraction cited prior studies. It was a small fraction. I think it was somewhere maybe on the order of 20 percent. So, yeah, a big concern. So I have a lot of I have a lot of anxiety. I have a lot of anxiety in general as a human being, <laughs> but, but but I have anxiety in this area. One of them is that a lot of these prescriptions that we are endorsing here. Uh, some of them we don't really have really good evidence uh, that they necessarily make a difference. They kind of make sense conceptually, but then sometimes we're surprised. I also actually have some worries about the quality of research on bias in and of itself. Uh, you know, I think it's important for us, I mean, I'm constantly thinking about this when I do my systematic reviews, is that I'm coming into this with a presumption that uh, these biases matter. Is this affecting what kind of data I include and what kind of data I exclude in my analysis? And I think we need to be cognizant that the biases that affect researchers also affect the researchers that are studying bias in researchers. <laughs> so I, th I think I'll add to that that probably our anxiety stems from trying to pretend that we're Canadians. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to nail my colors to the mast in response to one of your, your points, Malcolm, in that I do think it's really important at this stage just to sort of get a core set of principles um, 
implemented. I mean, I perhaps wouldn't have said that a few months ago, uh, but having had the response back from journal editors, I was quite struck by, by essentially that's what they were telling me. And great, you know, if you've endorsed the ARRIVE guidelines and you're implementing the ARRIVE guidelines, great, that's super. Uh, but in fact, I mean, we know that that's not happening, and so the responses that I was getting, even from um, journals where they had endorsed and, and, and had said that they would implement, was really, yes, we would subscribe to a core set of principles, and that's what we're, we're really looking uh, for. And I think I'd also add to that, and, and in a completely different uh, field, I uh, have run or run a, a small research fellowship program and we do sort of social science methodologies looking to see how we can implement the three R's. Um, and so I had one fellow who was looking at uh, vaccines um, and some, one of the th her key findings was that if you worked on international harmonization first, then actually um, you could get um, more local sort of national organizations to implement better practices, which surprised me because it was completely counterintuitive, but I think I've sort of bought into that need to sort of work on, on, on um, a, a broader, higher level, and, and that I see that as, as being important. Uh, Annette O'Connor from Iowa State University. I was wanting to ask about incentivization, and I was wondering um, if you think that systematic reviews have a role in incentivizing because the ability to sort of make the cut and get into review can sometimes be considered to be in to, making the cut in a Cochrane review sort of is suggestive that you've reported well and perhaps executed your study well. And I was wondering if you s see that as a valid sort of incentive and where it fits in preclinical studies. Can you can you just clarify? You, you mean you mean that um, system system? If we were to increase the volume of systematic review, the design of studies would improve because people would want to be cited by the systematic reviews. Or oh no, I'm not saying we should just necessarily increase the volume of systematic reviews. But when we go through the process of reviewing literature and we sort of establish that there are ideas that we should just include it all because uh, it's poorly reported or there are ideas of potentially having a cutoff and saying, look, I'm, there's a limit at which I'm not going to consider this evidence, and Cochrane is sort of, you know, it's got to be randomised, it's got to be blinded before we're going to include it. And I wonder, at the moment in preclinical medicine, that's really, really hard because you can't re review very much, right? You can't make a summary because you have so little literature that meets those sort of standards, and how do we balance those ideas and as an incentive for improving the quality of reporting getting into yeah. review. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It makes perfect sense. Thank you. So, um, look, we are all surrounded by moral problems in our lives, but only some of those moral problems are visible, are rendered visible. And part of what systematic review does is it renders visible a series of deficiencies that are otherwise unrecognizable. So, Glenn Begley's presentation, these are a series of papers right before they went, all the reviewers saw those, journal editors saw them, authors presumably saw them. Right before your eyes, they just simply, they simply, the, the deficiencies in that reporting and design were not rendered visible in a way, even though ostensibly they went right before the, you know. So I think that part of the task of, part of what systematic review does is it's making a pattern of practices visible that would be difficult to recognize if each study were looked at in isolation from the others. So I do think that the work that people like Malcolm McLeod is, you know, is doing and many other people, John Yanides, uh, that work is rendering visible a problem that would be otherwise invisible without that kind of systematization. And I guess I've also been wondering that, you know, sort of talking about at the institution level, how you um, reward investigators who are actually doing quality-based research. So rather than looking at uh, have you made it into a high-impact journal, looking at have you been able to produce research that was of, of a quality, maybe that it got included in a systematic review, or that it, it really sort of shone because it was done according to um, excellent scientific rigor. Jeff? Oh, Chinese one thing, but I, I mean, clearly, I don't have any answers at this point. Uh, my question's for, for Jonathan. Um, you seem to be surprised that the FDA didn't have a lot of requirements for um, uh, efficacy testing in, in preclinical models, or 
you know, guidance around it. And I guess I was wondering, what are you seeing within the pharmaceutical industry as a whole on this? Because what I'm seeing within our company, and I think a number of others, there are these major looks at what's causing drug attrition and what's causing the problems in the pipeline. And I'm actually seeing a very significant rollback of sort of preclinical animal models in many therapeutic areas where we don't have good models, including anxiety, uh, obviously. But um, you, you know, it, it seems like the trend's going the other way. And I, I didn't know what you were terming preclinical research. Are you terming animal-based models, or are you terming anything that came before first time in human? Because there's actually a tendency in the industry a little bit, there are people that say, hey, we, we've got to make sure it's safe to put into people, but then we have to get into the populations that we can really find out what it's going to do. Because you know, for many of these therapeutic areas, there is a lack of translational models right now. Yeah. So when I use the word preclinical, I am primarily talking about studies aimed at establishing proof of principle. So I'm not speaking about toxicology for one. And uh, I have primarily in mind studies in live animals. But there's no reason why m what I'm saying wouldn't apply. First of all, studies in live animals obviously include analyses of tissue from those live animals. So there's no reason why what I'm saying wouldn't apply to uh, in vitro studies as well. Uh, first of all, I'm not surprised in the least that FDA has not taken this issue up, so I just want to clarify. I, it's, it's, it's a regrettable, uh, perhaps, but it's not surprising. I, re I realize it's a resource-limited agency and that they're bound by certain kinds of, uh, of, of legislative restrictions. Um, but. And I can't speak with authority to what is done differently in the pharmaceutical sector versus in the public sector. My gut tells me that there are going to be big differences between what's going on in the academic sector, what goes on in biotech companies, and what goes on in pharmaceutical companies, in that if you're an academic researcher, your goal is to get into cell science or nature. Very short term. You don't have to worry about the translation. You just have to get into one of those journals, get your grant renewed, and you're done. If you're a biotech company, you just have to get into phase one or phase two and maybe get sold to a big pharmaceutical company. But you don't necessarily have to worry about the full translation of the product unless you're a big, big biotech company like Amgen. But if you're a pharmaceutical company, you only get a payoff once you've gotten all the way through the process. So I suspect the incentives would lead me to think that I'm guessing the pharmaceutical companies would probably be doing a much better job carefully screening their drugs early on than the biotech and the academic researchers, but I don't have any evidence to back that claim. In the middle. Right. Um, so um, there's been a lot to talk about the RAF guidelines, and I just wanted to give you an update on that. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about the lack of translation with the journals, um, and the RAF guidelines have been endorsed by many journals, but they've also been endorsed by all the major UK bio research, um, bioscience research funders, uh, like the Wellcome Trust and the MRC, um, who make compliance with the RAF guidelines um, when you publish a paper, condition of the funding, so we won't see the result of that um, until a few years down the line. Um, the guidelines have also been endorsed by um, all the major UK universities, um, and they are incorporated into uh, training for new PhD students or that kind of thing. Um, so this is really important because that really you know, tells people about the importance of them rather than just forcing the reporting uh, once the paper is already done. Um, and another initiative um, which is uh, currently in the planning but is going to happen soon is uh, looking at um, the, I mean, whether completing an arrived guideline checklist will actually influence the reporting. So PLUS is going to be um, the um, guinea pig journal on this. And, uh, and then we can, we can use the result of that study to uh, well inform implementation strategy um, and look at the items that might be problematic and might need to be revised. Um, so. Thank you very much for the for the update, and I, and I think it's true, you know, that, that these things take time, and uh, it's 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 baby steps. But it, it would be really nice uh, to be able to see them being implemented. So I look forward to sort of, you know, it it's it's cool because in the UK we have the National Centre for the Three R's, you know, and you guys are really well funded, and so you're able to do this excellent work.
Um, so what I look forward to is to sort of using those uh, those kind of initiatives to, to be able to sort of bring things along um, in a more international context too. Yeah. Um, just to add a small note on that, I mean, we, we, um, our view is that there's no need to reinvent the wheel in every different countries. Um, so we've actually been working in the US as well, um, and some universities are actually quite enthusiastic to come on board as well. Um, but this is going to take time, obviously. Uh, just very quick, yep, okay. we're running a little late. Um, so I'm uh, Damien Pattinson from PLOS One. Um, I just wanted to make the point that we actually um, already asked for arrived um, guidelines in papers where we're sort of particularly concerned about um, about ethical oversight. So uh, so in a reason, well, no, a small proportion by PLOS One standards, but a reasonable number of papers, um, we do actually ask for the checklist and we do find anecdotally that it is you know, substantially improving uh, reporting. So the sort of early data is, is quite encouraging on that. So. Thank you. Barbara, you have the last uh, question. Barbara Hanson from the University of South Florida. I want to pick up on two of your comments that I thought were right on. Uh, one of them was the difference between early preclinical and late preclinical, kind of in parallel to clinical studies. An awful lot of early preclinical you never see published. It's exploratory, it's developmental, and it's confidential. As one who has worked with both biotechs and pharma for the last 25 years in primates, uh, a lot of that you won't find in any review except what goes to the FDA, including my own work. My primate work often is not yet published when they go forward for human studies. So that doesn't mean the research wasn't done. I think that's an important uh, key thing. I think you also made a very good point about the differences between pharma, biotech, and academia. And the differences are profound. Some go straight from essentially a minimal small animal into primates. Others skip primates entirely and just go from mouse to human. And they make those judgments for many, many reasons. Of course, one of them being money, but not the only one by any means. For example, the receptor might be different in different species. So I think standardizing this process isn't really possible. Maybe just questions to ask, but not to standardize. Yeah, I'll say a couple things. Um, I mean, ethically, risks have to be redeemed by the benefits if you're experimenting on animals or human beings. And so somebody's got to make a call, a risk-benefit call, in a clinical trial that's based on preclinical studies or in an animal study that's based on prior evidence. And so, um, and that call is going to have to is going to depend on things like how well the prior study evidence has been aggregated, the quality of the study supporting studies, um, as well as the likely availability of the findings of the study that's being reviewed. So um, the principles are going to be the same across any sector, and I think it's important to remember that the ethics doesn't really change when you go into the pharma sector, biotech, etc. I do want to say one other thing just to qualify. Now that you agreed with me, it, 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 it frees me up to, to, to contradict myself. Um, so, so I think it's important. We often tend to think that preclinical research sort of it continues up until the point where we start a first in human study, and then everyone closes shop, no more preclinical, because uh, it's already the baton's been passed on. But the reality is that probably a, a good fraction of the preclinical work that goes on is happening concurrently with clinical development and even after a product is licensed. One of the dynamics that I'm seeing in a different project, not a preclinical project, but a project looking at clinical, the evolution of clinical evidence, is that the um, rigor of justification for initiating clinical trials works in the exact opposite direction as you go from academia to biotech to pharma. Let me just explain how, this, how I think this works. It's still early on. If you've got deep pockets, it doesn't cost you that much to go for a long shot. So if you've got a cancer drug and it works for a rare malignancy mesothelioma, why not shoot for breast cancer and colorectal cancer? If you, if you get lucky, you know, the drug's effective, you make tons and tons of money, you can take that risk if you've got deep pockets. If you're a biotech company, you have to put all your limited money down on your best shot. So you're going to make the most evidence-based decisions about uh, what trials you fund, and like similar dynamic in, in academia. So I suspect that pre-licensure, the, uh, again, the incentives work in favor of pharmaceutical companies probably having the most stringent 
the evaluation of the preclinical evidence. Once a drug is licensed, I think all bets are off. I suspect it works in the opposite direction. All right, thank you both very, very much.